Tonight, we welcome Gabe Katz to the stage of the Phoenix Theater. Gabe is widely considered to be one of Sonoma County's best drummers and has been a force in the music scene here for over 15 years. Tonight, we'll look back on the person he's become in that time, what is important to him now, and what comes next. Please welcome to the program, Gabe Katz. Welcome. Thank you. You mentioned uh, tonight when you were playing the guitar alone on stage, because you were not drumming tonight, you're playing guitar, that um, it was uh, uh, akin to nightmares you've had. Definitely. What are these nightmares that you've had? Well, the feeling of like you're in a theater and the lights are on you and there's dark, no one out there. I have dreams like that sometimes. Well, welcome to the show. Gabe Thank Katz. you. Thanks My so much. Goodness. Yeah. I have I have a secondary intro, and uh, it's a thought that I was talking with you earlier about. And I think one of one of the things that the three of us have in common is that we've all been very visible music scene people for, uh, for three of us the last fifteen years. You yeah. obviously much longer, Tom. A couple years, and, sixteen years, uh, and that's interesting that's because we we kind of we've kind of like have had parallel lives. There's been times where we've all done different things, but we've all known each other because of this place yeah. that we live in this time. When I first came here to the Phoenix, I was nine. As a child, my yard duty was playing a show here. Cool. And he invited us, and we got to go. They were what band was he in? Scenic Drive. Scenic Drive, yeah, I recall. I thought you might. Okay. Uh, a story I used to hear about you is that when you were younger, because you've always been a drummer that people have looked up to and respected, but when you were younger, like touring bands would come and they would see you, and you would get sometimes invited on the road. Is that true? Sometimes, yeah. And it, what I always heard is that you would usually turn them down when you were younger. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I feel like that that little anecdote about you, I feel like really sums you up in a good way because it feels like you were not into it for the, the fame and the fortune necessarily at that time. You, you were into the camaraderie of uh, the, the, the friends that you had and the bands that you were in mm-hmm. and also the, like, the autonomy of like, this is my project and I want to I do that or I believe in the people that I'm playing with as opposed to playing with strangers. Is that true? Yeah, totally. That was like a, there was a sort of loyal to a fault quality maybe i think it changed i started saying yes to bands more as i got older yeah if they would like pay me or just for a chance to get on the road and do more playing elsewhere i guess but all the while still i still am in the same band i mean i still play music with the same people i did when i was 10 so still pretty strong yeah um connection there yeah i just always thought it was a good window in your personality because there are some music people who are uh, they are in it to get famous. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, I feel like that has not been your thing, and maybe sometimes to your own detriment that has not been your thing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I, li- I like that. I like being... Um, um, I believe in what I do with my friends, and I, I, always, I always believe that the bands or artists or whatever that do well are the ones that sort of... They believe what in what they're doing, and, you know, I mean... Metallica, they were best friends at some point, and maybe they're not now, and maybe they're not enjoyable at all to listen to anymore. Maybe there's something to that. Beatles, same kind of thing. I feel like when we love bands, it's when they love each other so much we can kind of, even if you're just a total non-music person, non-nerd person, and you're not sure why you feel that way, that's maybe what you're feeling, the attraction to like, ah, I mean, my favorite bands are like when I go on tour or whatever, it's always like I can tell these four people are hanging out before they play and then they're on stage and having the best time. And then afterward, they're hanging out. It's like best friend. Yeah. The love is is so huge for that. So I always just kind of like I experimented with playing with other people and it's great and it's exciting and they become great friends. But those bonds that you do make with people you play with are sort of like the most inspiring, I guess, for me. So you are even like, as a, as a viewer of music, you maybe are more forgiving of technical ability if you sense like a love and a camaraderie between them. There's an intangible there when you feel that there's love between the band members. Definitely, yes. Yeah. I love like, not gonna name names obviously, but throughout the past, some bands that I've just loved there. It's like, um, 
you go to a restaurant because of the vibe and yeah. the food's not really good. Yeah. I'm guilty of that all the time. I'm like, that place is great. And then I tell a friend, they're like, it wasn't very good. And I'm like, well, the food's not great. You like how it made you feel. <laughs> yeah, like the, the, the people are great. <laughs> yeah, the energy yeah. is great. Or, you know, like, so there's some bands that are like that where it's just like, they're not technically incredible, but there's a powerful... Um, emanating force of love or something. You are an interesting enigma in this way because you are a talented musician. Thank and you. And you are, uh, taste-wise, I think that you probably would say you have kind of like specific tastes in music, but you're not like a snob. You know what I mean? Like you can enjoy like stuff that some people would look at as like not good because you find things to like about it. Yeah, and maybe that's a, I'm getting better at that as I get older, I feel like in my twenties, I was just very much a snob, maybe yeah. even like proud of being a snob as far as like, that sucks. Yeah. When your twenties, your tastes were better and you just generally were better than all the normies. <laughs> I just kind of, yeah. and now you've realized you've gotten older. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're actually not. Yeah. We just deteriorate. And so does my, my taste is probably who, who can trust it at this point. Yeah. But I, um, yeah, I, I try to be op- more open-minded. Maybe that gets easier as you get older or something. I don't know if that's true. Maybe. Well, that's uh, okay. And then, then okay, here's a question for you. Gabe, the, the teenager in Coma Lilies, is the person that I met. And now here we are, 2019 Gabe Katz, 34 years old. How do you feel those two are different? Because um, some people radically change. Yeah. And other people it's more subtle and they're, uh, they're pretty much the same. And I, I wonder how you feel about yourself. Yeah. That's a great question. I, um, I know I'm different. I think in a lot of ways I am the same as far as like my motivations and what's important to me as far as playing music with my friends and all that kind of basic, maybe not to other people basic, but to me basic stuff. Um, but more forgiving of crappy bands obviously for one but um um more forgiving of yourself maybe more forgiving of myself maybe more forgiving of <laughs> others too yeah definitely I mean, this is something i I've, I've i've always respected about you you can see and i won't name examples but like we we've had conversations over the years about like okay generally society believes like this person over here is a bad person yeah but you have always i think tried to be like there's a reason this person is the way that they are and I'm not defending them, but it's like, you know, this person had bad stuff happen to them that made them this way. Yeah. And I just feel like that's always been a priority of yours. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I, and I work on that. I talk about that a lot. Like it's having compassion for people that have done people are, you come into the world perhaps in a situation or a, environment or whatever and it's you plus the environment it's like the fish and the water we affect our environment and our environment affects us it's kind of like a there's not one or the other i guess so i do try to be you know i try not to um judge people too harshly for making mistakes i guess and also i try to let them change you know when someone does something horrible they're not that horrible thing maybe they uh, I try to look at them as a sort of changing, growing thing instead of like a permanent shit stain on the planet or something. I don't really feel like people deserve that necessarily. Maybe there's exceptions to this, but I try to at least give people the benefit of the doubt or something if I can. I don't know. You think that's a family thing? Yeah. You think that's a not not a social thing? You think that you 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 got that from family teaching? I think so. I had like a um um I had like an uncle that was a pretty bad drug addict and a bad, you know, he had a hard time in life. And, um, we, I never remember thinking of him as a bad guy. I remember there being kind of like a, it's sad that he does bad stuff or like, it's sad that he is having a hard time. It's not like this is a bad guy. So it was just sort of like, for me, it was like, Oh, that's my uncle. I love him. And, um, what he did, did and what he was going through was separate from who he was I feel like and if in my family I think there's sort of a strong sort of we can show the worst of ourselves to each other and we'll still love each other and that's kind of what family is or to us or something or at least that's what I interpreted well I mean in its best form absolutely yeah. yeah and with friendship it's the same thing and I feel like if any everyone I mean I don't want to 
tell everyone what to do, but if in myself I can apply that to relationships of any kind, they, it tends to work out a little bit better. Yeah, we don't tend to ask questions like this on here, but I feel like I know you well enough that I can. Okay. Um, well, it's family related, and it's not bad at all. It's just that it's, this is like fucking psychoanalysis 101, <laughs> and I try, to, I try to put enough skins on this to where it doesn't seem like I'm doing that. <laughs> but, That's okay. But I... I but see, he's coming out tonight. I'm, well, yeah. yeah. This show has been great for me coming out a number of ways. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's cool. Uh, it's my therapy, too. I feel like something that all three of us have is uh, uh, kind of like, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but kind of like similar styles of mother. And I think, <sighs> and I say that because all three of us uh, live lives that are, they're both like, forward facing sometimes we like do things where people are like get this like fucking showboat out of here you know uh, we have this desire to be in front of people we have this desire to be social we have we are very much uh you know uh, I, I think we all three value like being ourselves yeah yes. i don't think that the three of us have a desire to conform and actually i think we actively push against that and yeah I, f- I feel like you only get to or there's a lot of different ways to come to it but i feel like something we all have in common is is like mothers that were very, very, very supportive in that. Yeah, to make it easy to to grow and find yourself. And, I never and feel really comfortable thought to try. about that for mm-hmm. myself because I, you know, my mom and I, who I love very much, there has been some complications here and there, and sometimes you get frustrated, especially as you're growing up. But it, then you think like, well, gosh, I mean, if a person shows you unconditional love and you are you have yeah. the freedom to like be the yes. fullest version of your person that you possibly can be, seems like they did their job the absolute yeah. best yeah. way they should yeah. have. For sure. Do you guys feel that way about oh, your yeah. moms as well? Yeah, absolutely. I had I had a safe environment uh, through her to be an experiment who with who I was. Absolutely, and and boy, unconditionally. Yeah. And I boy, I had some monumental fuck ups, and and she was uh, yeah she was unconditional and unwavering in that. Support you, even in like uh, career choices and and certain personal decisions. There was that, never even that was never even a part of the question. That never came into the. Uh, it's just all. I mean, as I was as I was screaming and shouting my way through, you know, my uh, childhood and teen years. Yeah, she was right there going. That's all right. You'll get there. You'll get there, and and uh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, so. I feel like you don't get to be you without that. Yeah, you know, I mean, you you are one of the more radically unconforming adults that I know, and you can look at it just from what you do here at the Phoenix. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mo- most people yeah. are very confused by the Phoenix. Yes, yeah. and uh, I, <laughs> I love that part of it. Yeah, I know, I know you do. Yeah. And and I and I just I was just thinking today. I was like, I wonder if his mom was that way. I feel like she was. Um, you know, <laughs> she never. I bet she never like gave no. me a hard time about any decision. No, that there she was made. never a question. Yeah, yeah. there was I never a question that she loved you or not. No. Never. Yeah. yeah, absolutely not. And I don't know yeah. if you feel that way about yours. I, 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 totally. I totally. get that vibe from your relationship with her. Yeah, my mom is um, really supportive yeah. and really compassionate and really nice yeah. and like um, super sensitive, emotional person. Um, so I wonder, what about your dads then? Like, do your do you have like more stern father figures or for me it's like my mom is i think of her as super emotional these i'm i'm in therapy so i like i'm i'm boiling this shit down lately but these terms so it's like my mom is so emotional and my father i think of is very almost hyper rational which is like i think of those both as incredible strengths my dad was not like a jerk they're both so supportive of me and what i'm doing my dad would give more rational advice you know if i would come to like a fork in the road he's like it was almost like his duty to give me the more rational advice and there was almost an understanding an unspoken understanding of me being like that is good advice yes. and i'm probably not going to take it and he'd still be so proud of whatever way i went so it's not like they were opposites in support but my dad offered more he's just a super amazingly rational person my mom's not totally irrational or anything but they just offered those um different points of view i guess and um i think they both inform i feel like i'm sort of right in the middle of like that i think naturally maybe i'm more emotional like my mother but i'm so inspired by my father's rational brain because he's i know he's also a very emotional sensitive human being too and we're so connected on such a emotional plane but I'm just blown away by his ability to sort of navigate emotional situations with rational 
thought. So I try, I'm trying to do that more in life, but it's still, but you know, still honoring the sensitive emotional drive I have. It's, I'm working on it. Yeah. And to answer your question, I, I, I don't know. It's a little more complicated on my end with that. Um, I only I leapt to the mothers not because of any disrespect to the fathers or any commentary on the sure. fathers. I just I look at the 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 uh, unconditional nurturing emotional love of of my mother, uh, and I and I saw similarities in yours. Sure, totally. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think they I think they both have been largely supportive. I mean, there's no there's no question in that. I don't know how you feel about your dad. I, I feel like a little. Um, I mean. I feel like you two have maybe uh, butted heads a little we, bit more than you would, than you oh, would yeah. with your mother. Yeah, we were, we were in a, a head-butting relationship. And yeah. it, a lot of it, most of it was probably me, again. Yeah. Uh, although, and the thing is that my dad coming from uh, such a straight, uh, regimented situation before, um, yeah, I made little sense to him at, at times. And I think that was there were, uh, there were issues between him and I about that. Um, but looking at, uh, I wanted to be able to pull off his public persona because he had, he was great at that. That's the one thing he could really do well. And, uh, yeah, I remember I was striving to be there with, uh, with that for my dad. I, <laughs> finally, I didn't quite get, uh, I just was never sensible enough, but he did a flip, uh, after I'd been at the theater for a while and realized that, uh, wow, this is. You're not going to make any money with this thing, are you? No, probably not. <laughs> but you're doing something. It was this total flip, I think. Uh, by the time I'd hit uh, maybe 40 or so, he, he and I were beginning to understand. I, I always understood his way of doing business. But he was beginning to understand that there was sense to the nonsense. And uh, that really started to get easier between the two of us about that time. Yeah. And so you examining this stuff in therapy then has helped you kind of understand why you are the way you are and like try to like work within those confines and uh, you know, you're still you. Yeah. You can just help navigate the emotions you feel and like what you show to the world and all that. Yeah. It's, for me, going to therapy has been the like best thing ever. I love it. I go to therapy right over there. Yeah. It's like the last year. And so even in the past... <laughs> If someone said to me, like, you should go to therapy, I'd be like, fuck you. Like, that's, you don't say that. That's, to me, that was like, something's wrong with you and you need to fix it. And so I never went. Um, and one of my friends was in therapy and he seemed to really enjoy it. And we were on tour together and he would be like, every week I got to like, talk to my therapist. And I was like, oh, kind of like, are you okay? And he was like, yeah, it's like the best thing. And he's like, I talk to my therapist and I like cry and I just like get it out. And I like, I'm like, this sounds pretty cool. And so I started, um, additionally found myself at a part of my life where I was, um, <clears throat> unable to sort of deal with my emotional state and like my situation I was in. And so I was like, maybe I should try this. It was sort of around the same time. And so I, got into therapy and it was like instantly like so helpful and um so now I go every week and like learn these skills to kind of use rational thought to keep in check my totally because I'm sort of like just like a pretty purely emotional creature I'm so sensitive and so um sensitive is probably the best way to put it and um I think I attribute that sensitivity to a lot of my success as far as art and creativity and um, being able to let people in and that sort of thing. But also I let people in sometimes and it doesn't feel good or something. And I, I have, n I had no concepts of boundaries at all until I started going to therapy and they kind of taught me about that. And I was like, Oh, that's like a, I can protect myself while being vulnerable, which I didn't, I thought it was just sort of like a, on off switch situation. So now I'm kind of learning this like spectrum of uh, just sort of men, uh, emotional awareness, I guess, that I can like use to know when a situation that I'm in that is emotional closer to the negative side of the spectrum is, you know, um, I think historically speaking, every time there was a confrontation of any kind that I was in, it was my fault 100% of the time. That's what I thought and that's what I would really feel and so like any tension that someone else was 
offering, I would just take it on. And it feel it felt better to me to see someone else feel better. And I would just take their attention and I would just like store it. And then I'm 33 and I have all the stored tension and I have no like tools to unpack it. So I was carrying it around and I, I was really um, disassociating and very like not really here. If you were talking to me, I would sort of just like be elsewhere. And it was really, I was really not present with the people that I love. And I was really starting to notice it. It was like finally getting to the point where it was actually um, getting in the way of me living a kind of healthy life. Um, so learning tools to do that has helped me so much. And so now I kind of feel myself like more present and sort of more, um, I can listen to people and like hear them. And I'm, I'm still able to maybe help people feel better, but I, if I don't necessarily take tension that doesn't belong to me. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're like, Gabe, fuck you, you did this shit. I can say, did I do this shit? And then I can say like, I can still see my responsibility. I know I'm still part of this equation. If I wasn't here, maybe this shit wouldn't be happening, but there's no way this is all my fault. If it's Jim plus Gabe, it's gotta be part Jim too. So I can at least, in that way, instead of, there's almost sort of like a, dark narcissism in taking on all the responsibility for something. I'm really taking away from you how you feel and it doesn't involve you. And it's like, I'm like, I don't have time to take into consideration how Jim feels in this situation. So now I can kind of do that better. I'm, I'm still working on it, obviously, but, and obviously this is a hypothetical. I think we're cool. I think we're fine. Yeah. Cool. Great. Yeah. And I, I think also you have the ability to uh, not to, I, I, you are you, and but I just when I hear you say that, I feel like you you can um, you can still do what you would do before, which is like diffuse a situation by being like, hey, you know what, it's okay. But you can also now sort that in your mind and be like, eh, I mean, it's really their fault, but I'm going to write it off and not take it personally because sometimes that's what the situation calls for. Yeah, totally. Sometimes, and also just being able to be like, not just say that. Yeah, this is your fault, actually. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't need that. <laughs> The verbal, just so you know, <laughs> you know, like you did this. I, the, yeah, yeah. And I maybe maybe we're never sure who's at fault, and maybe it doesn't matter. It, mostly, and ultimately, nothing really matters. Oh, thank uh, you for saying all, that. But we all think that it does, and uh, I don't know. Maybe they will get to that eventually in the therapy. Uh, it it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Uh, but we all think everything matters so much. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. This is huge. Yeah, I I do feel that nothing really matters, not in an apathetic way, but just in a it's all good. Well, in like the way that you, you can be driving with some people and like, let's say your passenger, your friend's driving and a uh, guy flips off your friend who's driving. There are some friends who will get so mad in that moment. And my uh, counter would be, how do you not just laugh at this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, cause who cares what that person in the car just did? And I, 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 it's a dumb example I'm giving, but I feel like so much conflict in life centers around that sort of thing. Yeah. It's like, who, who cares that this person is like looking at you the wrong way? Uh, but obviously this is stuff, you know, like you say, you were carrying stuff you didn't know you were carrying for 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. and that's going to affect how you respond to the world around you. Absolutely. And I feel like though that's a good example, like, um, of a, a trigger, you know, some people, um, for me, maybe a good example is I'm a very, um, accident prone person. I stub my toe a lot or I'll, I live in a very small house too, so I'm constantly kind of stubbing my knee or whatever. And my girlfriend and I laugh about it, and it is very funny. But it's like a multiple times a day I am stubbing my toe, and so does she have the same problem? No, huh. no, she doesn't. Um, she's much more graceful. So I'm maybe last year I would be like stub my toe, and my reaction would be like, "Fuck! I hate this couch <laughs> that I stubbed my toe on," and. I didn't, <laughs> it seems silly now, but it's really not the couch's fault that I stubbed my toe on well, I, I see, I, I would be the guy to disagree with okay. that. Okay, yeah. I should, well, I got rid of my couch, actually, you should see? know, okay. I didn't have room for a couch, so. But um, that frustration, that's, I guess, maybe I had just some unchecked emotions of anger or whatever that were kind of coming out when any time I could get a chance to kind of leak out, because I'm not a very angry person, and I don't have a good relationship with anger, never saw positive benefits of being angry, even though I listened to Rage Against the Machine a lot when I was a kid. And now I see they were doing that, using anger as this positive force. Yeah. Uh, but I've, 
I never liked myself when I would get angry and I couldn't, if I did get angry, it would be such a raw emotion. That's what I was curious about. Like, how did it manifest itself? Because obviously you got angry. Yeah. I mean, if I was pushed. Yeah. And I have been at certain times pushed to this place of anger and then it's just sort of, I mean, because I'm such a sensitive person, it it doesn't linger in the strength, I'm going to change something now, anger. It's more just like, uh, it, it morphs to a pathetic, sad s- yeah, mo- state of being. Like a mopey, sad anger. Yeah, maybe, yeah. or I'll just be like, uh, belligerent cussing or whatever shape it took, I did not like it. And I could see myself from the inside kind of unable to stop it. I mean, not like I had anger issues, but just like, this isn't helping. And when that would happen... Afterward, I'd be like, I don't like that. And then I didn't help. Um, now I'm learning the, that you can kind of like focus your anger and make positive change, which is still like something pretty crazy. So I'm still like, I'm trying to get in touch with my anger. Even I don't really feel that angry right now. I feel pretty good. But um, I know now that if it comes up, it's not so bad and I can kind of like access it. But before when I was stubbing my toe, it would just like come out in this little burst of like, fuck my couch. And um, all the while, Tom, even though, yes, on one hand, fuck the couch, but on the other hand, why am I so angry like when the guy flips you off? Okay, what's interesting to me though is you're focusing on the couch. Is it better or worse? And who has use for these terms, right? (laughs) Nothing matters. Right, right. (laughs) It's all relative. But is it better or worse to be like mad at yourself? You know what I mean? And have you ever experienced that when, when uh, your accidents happen? Absolutely. Like, you fucking idiot. You fucking moron. Is that better or worse? I don't know. And then thirdly, it, what if you're just mad at the situation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're not yeah. mad at the couch. You're not mad at you. You're just mad at the situation that ended up with you kicking the couch. Yeah, I've been, I've definitely, definitely been like mad at myself too. You know, that goes back to the blaming myself for everything piece, I guess. But um, and certainly the situation, I think I'm getting better at seeing the situation. Yeah. It is, it's a shitty situation when one stubs their toe on the couch. It's nobody's fault, really. Yeah. But I think the... the <laughs> I know the point you're making is, <laughs> the that, point is, that, <laughs> is that there's this overwhelming <laughs> amount of anger in you or, or emotion in you yeah. that, that like, it's like trying to get out and then something happens and then, oh, this is kind of weird that I'm feeling so much at this kind of dumb thing. Right. Yeah. And that if you're... If that's the only time your emotions can sneak out, there's not a lot of time that you're giving it to be like, what is this emotion? Because obviously it's like, that's pain. just pain from yeah. toe jamming or yeah. whatever. But maybe if I had my uh, emotions just a little more in check or just giving myself time to uh, unpack some of that uh, suppressed r- rage or sadness or whatever, when I stub my toe, it's just like, ah, I stubbed my toe. Ow. You could just say, ow. I feel like if you say, ow, that's pain. But if you're like, fuck this couch, or I'm such a fucking idiot, because I know the fucking couch is right there. You did know. Then maybe you're sort of like on one end of this spectrum where, you know, there's a safe place in the middle to just be like, ow, it hurts when I stub my toe, and I should be more careful. And that's kind of where I'm aiming that's to get to. That's kind of the Mr. Rogers approach I was going to say, it's kind it. of the Ned Flanders <laughs> approach. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Ow, diddly, diddly, diddly. Yeah, diddly. yeah <laughs> it is like Mr. Rogers. Do you feel like this work has caused you to have more empathy for other people and their outbursts and anger? Or do you feel like this work has mostly just benefited you and how you feel in your own skin with your own emotions? Mm, maybe a little more empathy, but certainly more. It is more of a process of just sort of trying to I didn't have a problem being empathetic to others. Yeah. If anything, I had a problem being too empathetic to you others. Had, you had a problem being empathetic with yourself. Yeah, maybe. Or just sort of like, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I'm still learning to make time for my own emotions or my own, um, like in the situation where I'm taking the tension off someone, do I have tension of my own that needs to sort of like, needs a place to go or something you know what i mean so i don't think my problem was being insensitive to others so much it was sort of like a extreme of being so overly sensitive in myself but also so overly sensitive to others but not um not sensitive to myself in the way that like i was listening to myself or, or actually like making anything better it was sort of just like i just feel this weight and i don't know how to deal with it or something does that make any sense yeah and i guess the only other question to ask on this front is like how, how do you process these emotions then in a different way you know what i mean 
Yeah. I mean, is it, do, you, do, you, do you have tools or are you just it's a different way of framing things? Or is it just the simple act of going and talking to somebody once a week like helps you just kind of do an inventory of what you're feeling and what you're doing? Um, that it does help. Um, the routine of it even in itself helps. But also maybe just seeing like having someone that's sort of not your friend or your family. No, no, but they don't have a responsibility to tell you what would make you feel good. They don't have to take tension off of you which loved ones do. We do that with each other. And it's a beautiful thing, but also just being like, for me being like, what the hell is wrong with me in this situation? I must be weird. And for someone that's just sort of like, maybe the situation is weird. Maybe you are not that weird. Maybe this is how someone reacts in a situation like this. Um, so that kind of stuff helps. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I don't fully know how to answer the question, but, um, well, I guess what it leads to then is like you've been uh, in a relationship now with someone that's changed your life a lot, mm-hmm. Melinda. And I, and I think in becoming like more forgiving of yourself through this process, it's probably also helped you coexist with someone. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And before I was with Melinda, I was very much by myself for years. And I thought that was just sort of going to be my permanent state of being. And so maybe got to the point where I didn't have to learn these skills because I wasn't really affecting anyone too closely. And then maybe like getting together with someone so closely and seeing how we affect each other and seeing how I affected this person and being like, wow, I would really like to not bring my negative shit here. And like when trouble would come up of some kind, that whole piece of not knowing what I'm feeling, not knowing if this is my fault, not knowing how to help this person. I would sort of, sort of like if a confrontation of any kind or we got into trouble, not like fighting each other, but just like we as a unit where we were faced with some sort of problem in the outside world, how would I be able to be like strong and like, um, available to, um, survive it and sort of stay positive through like, you know, stuff like not having lots of money or, you know, having to move out of our house or just, you know, normal adult situations. Like I don't want to just be getting crushed or like disassociate. I want to be able to be a source of strength for this other person too, or just like, you know, Hey, this is going to be fine. We can just, we'll one step at a time. We'll problem solve. So like, um, our mechanism for problem solving being strengthened is such a big deal to me. And I think going to therapy is helping me kind of fine tune that. So you kind of thought you were going to be like hermit music making guy. Yeah. If, uh, that's what it seemed like. And when you sit, when you're alone for a long time, that's what it feels like. Totally. And then, so now you're not, and this is, this is good. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty great. <laughs> it's good. And, yeah. and, and so that's my question is like, um, how has that changed you? Do you feel like fundamentally, like how you interact with the world, how you make art, um, like has like a uh, Gabe of solitude. Uh, does he differ greatly from now uh, partnered Gabe? Yes. Um, probably less cynical, less, um, you know, like wanting to be strong in a positive way, less, uh, negative, maybe just sort of, more resilient to, um, um, you know, challenging situations, maybe. Um, also, maybe something happened where I wanted, you know, when I was alone, I, I live on people's couches, and that was fine, and I did that for a long time, or I lived, like, in a basement, like, in Portland when I lived there, not, like, a furnished basement, but, like, a moldy basement with, like, rats and, like, yeah, there are nice basements, and then this there are was, the basements that you stayed in. This was, like, not a nice basement. Like, you could see the um, the floor of the, the ceiling above you was the floor of the house, and there was, like, sort of, like, a pocket of, like, fluid, maybe. Oh. Um, and I lived there with a friend in the basement. What was the fluid? We never, we joked about poking it with a stick or something, but we just didn't ever want to do that. Who knows, it could have been, like, a rotting a raccoon or whatever but the point i'm making is i <laughs> that was fine for like a single person 
but like once I kind of like coupled with another human being, perhaps my standards of healthy living got a little bit higher. Like I want to help take care of this person and I want to provide a safe environment for this other person and for myself. So it was almost like taking care of myself became a little bit more important when before it was just like sleep in the car, sleep on the floor, whatever. And I was like, well, my partner and I aren't exactly going to sleep in the basement. So we need to have like a place to live that's warm. Um, and so there was sort of like a leveling up of like becoming an adult for the first time ever that I sort of had to um, take into consideration, which was a huge shift for me because before Lone Gabe didn't have to think about that kind of shit. So, um, and I think even Lone Gabe would have thought of that kind of shit as maybe kind of like a, not like a selling out, but kind of just like a compromising in a negative way. And now the way I see that is very much the opposite. It's, it's maybe it's still compromising in some way, but not, I'm not giving up anything I needed to be holding on to. I could let go of sleeping in that yucky basement and I can take some solace in, I live in a warm house with, um, carpet and there's a heater. But I, I think Gabe, uh, Gabe, the, the solitude guy, <laughs> um, didn't mind the moisture. No, he, in fact, I think he kind of wore it as kind of a funny badge of honor because it allowed him the autonomy that he thought he needed to live this life of music. Right. And yeah, so perhaps now I know, I mean, my partner is super supportive and I can still tour. I can still be creative. I can still being, with someone else is not sacrificing those things. If I mean, if you have a healthy relationship. So it's like, I mean, and the other part of that is that I don't actually want to be on tour all year. I'd like to have, I'd like to sleep and rest. And there is some sort of, maybe that's something about getting older too, which is just like craving stillness and quiet. When, when I was younger, I didn't want to stand still even for a second. So, um, Maybe they just kind of happened at the same time, but it was sort of like, oh, actually seeing my friends that tour all year round and see their girlfriends or their moms like one day a year, I'm not envious of them. I mean, I'm sometimes when I'm home and I'm not doing anything or something or I'm doing the dishes or whatever and I look on Instagram and they're like playing huge shows, some bug is like, oh, that would be cool if I could play those huge shows. But then I go visit them on tour and they're just like, they're not... <laughs> Yeah. They're not super happy. And, you know, and I'm like, I'm so lucky I can go home and like see my partner and yeah. we can like talk and we can hang out and cuddle and whatever. And then, you know, I can go play a show and have that. Yeah. I can visit that world tomorrow night and come back that same night and be in my little cool comfy zone. So, um, you know, no disrespect to my friends that are touring, seeing them live in their dream is the most beautiful thing to me. But realizing that perhaps I have more dreams than just being on the road all the time or whatever. Maybe part of my dream is to be like in a healthy relationship and to be like safe and have a dog and cook and eat and take a shower. St st stability is part of the dream now, which is maybe strange and different than solitary Gabe was. Yeah. This, this has been like the uh, like the season of on stage, the 2019 year, where like all all the past guests find love and like some amount of peace inside themselves, um, and it's it's really interesting to watch because like part of the like the drive for fame, fortune, success, talent, whatever uh, whatever drives a person to live this sort of life is is interesting, and you needed it to like become as good as you are at the stuff that you play. Like I, I think if 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 uh, the thirty four year old Gabe, who's as content as as he is now, had that level of contentness when he was a preteen or a teen, I'm not sure that he would have gotten as good at the drums. Sure, yeah. There's some sort of like, I always think about the um, the juice and the squeeze. You know, artists are getting s squeezed, and so that beautiful juice comes out. You know, maybe the angst of great artists. You know, is why they are such great artists. I don't know, but then. Or and then I still feel like you could probably still be a great artist and still have some sort of healthy stability. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's interesting to sit here with you and, and see like, I don't know, in the last five years, you, you've, you've realized that you don't need to be solitary and perhaps kind of unhappy. You can actually do both. And that's a big moment. I, I'm, I'm glad yeah. that we're kind of documenting that. Thank you. I feel good about that, too. You, d you met Melinda when? Um, three and a half years ago. Okay. So before you were on the show for the first time in 
March of 2015 <laughs> with your band Hoarders. I hadn't, yeah, I hadn't met her yet. Yeah. So that was old Gabe. We were talking to Solitary Gabe at that time. That was the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some kind of party going on back then, I guess. I don't know. Do you think that meeting her has had an effect on your art? So we just talked about like your personality and your worldview and the type of life you wanted to live. But do you think that meeting her has had an effect on the music that you play and how you approach that? Probably. I think it would be hard to. Well, you're... you're you're coming tonight with an entirely different project than I expected to see. It was going to be Gabe, well, <coughs> Gabe with a guitar. And then I come in and I see there's not even vocal mic set up. And I go, wow, this is Gabe absolutely jumping into a whole new medium from what I'd expected to see. Spectacular. And another thing Thanks. in terms of like the vibe, it's very similar to the music that you have made your entire career. Yeah. Crafting a dark, ominous sense of uh, foreboding. Mm -hmm. with uh, instruments and usually no vocals except yeah. this is a very pared down version of that yeah there is there is tension in what you what you play i can i can hear that but at the same time it, it it's got a pretty easy flow to it it's it's interesting i uh, really enjoyed it thank you it it moved throughout the phoenix throughout the building itself and it, it played really well in this house cool and i had some chores that I decided you know what because uh, you were working through a couple things and, and uh, so I'm wandering through the building and I'm hearing in all different areas and, and uh, the tension is there but the flow is also uh, a relief very cool it's almost like a river thank you I, I like that yeah. analogy a lot the river it's yeah. a, I have a song called the river ah, cool. I didn't play it though tonight and so like my guitar music um <clears throat> I've played guitar since I was 15 and it's been very private. And a lot of the bands I've been in, like Hoarders, I write a lot of the tunes and um, on guitar in my room. That's part, been part of my solitude situation. I'm in my room and I write my songs and I have tons of time to practice them and play them. And um, even in the Coma Lilies days, I wrote some of those songs too or I would help arrange them on guitar and stuff too. So my like melodic spirit definitely leaked in there um more or less sometimes more um but uh only recently i decided to sort of like make public my yeah. very uh private thing and so it is so like so vulnerable and ho it's horrifying i've played five shows now and it's the most terrifying thing ever to do why is that terrifying um because it's that much more private i think and with drums it's like i have like a barrier and i'm loud like when i play a show on guitar i can hear like the drunk lady in the back like yelling That's over true. my set and it's like so personal and i still have, yeah. to, I have to focus and it's just such a different thing and i guess it's maybe something about just it being more melodic or just like you know yeah. uh the tones involved like and it's just me too the the solitary kind of like this is very much my inside on the outside this is like up to now these are songs that are just so personal and they barely make it out of my bedroom which is sort of like this making this decision to um make public those very private things it's just kind of just feels vulnerable and maybe just because it's so new i guess too it makes it kind of scary to share it also music has always been a thing of camaraderie for you and you as the drummer you've always had three four people in front of you yeah and this is now uh, you alone totally do you feel like you channel like the fears and anxieties you have into these songs? And is that why they're so personal? Absolutely. Cause that's what I feel when I hear it. I, I don't know what you're feeling. Uh, you know, it's, it's you, you know, and maybe that, maybe you want to share it. Maybe you don't, but it's like, uh, you listen to these songs and it's just like, Ooh, it feels like there's a dark undercurrent here. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all definitely like, um, maybe more intentional, uh, me processing specific, um, specific emotions or just specific feelings or specific situations, definitely. And I'm get, maybe getting more fluent in it, being able to sort of like, all right, I know how to play it now. I can kind of like let it come out. These, I've always been able to process these emotions, expressing them without any sort of cognitive understanding of what I'm expressing. And now I'm kind of learning to sort of like, oh, I'm deliberately, ex I'm communicating specifically what I'm feeling and I think just having an understanding of that makes it that much more vulnerable it's not like 
I mean, obviously to the listener, it's abstract as it can be. It's up to interpretation. But for me, it's not abstract anymore. It's very much like this song's about this specific thing. So um, the first song I play, am I going to play? Whatever. I don't know. That. Anyway, the first song I played, <laughs> is, I call, it's called the, um, the Limits of My Control. And that's very much about me like seeing all this stuff in my life that I cannot control and just trying to accept it and just be okay with it and find sort of a peace within that. Um, I think they're all sort of about that kind of like, here's the big heavy emotion and here's me trying to just accept what I can do. I can take responsibility for it and I can try my hardest to sort of navigate it. But in it's kind of in the vein of nothing really matters to a certain extent, I can't really control any of this stuff and so just kind of seeing my limits and being okay with it is a big part of my process I guess with some of these tunes and the second one I um played is was the last song I wrote before I met Melinda and it's called making the best of being alone forever and so sort of like okay I'm gonna be alone forever and I can just be like a bummer but that's dumb and that's a waste of life and I'm just gonna like I was almost 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 okay with it I was sort of like I can still be a happy person. And I think looking back, maybe I know for a fact I'm a lot happier now, but still like it was still important for me to be like face myself and sort of spend time by myself and sort of get to know myself and accept myself as a person. I'm not such a bad guy to be around. So I just had to kind of like hang out with myself. And so I wrote that tune as sort of like a ditty of like, I'm just me on the deck and I'm just chilling and doodling and that's not such a bad thing so yeah and then um yeah so the songs are sort of <laughs> you, I mean, you can do the other two I mean, I, I, I find it very interesting and, I, and it, it resonates with me too okay and I also love how this stuff always seems to work you write that song what was that last song called making the best of being alone forever it just seems like that is just always how it works you had come to peace with it you were like, this is yes. going to be my reality. And you're like, all right, well, this is the reality. So this here's the song. And then, of course, yeah, next and thing you know, you meet her. Walks Melinda like a week later. Yeah. yeah. So that was cool. And um, Always how it works. Yeah, it's weird. And the other one. Stop looking and it will find you, essentially. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, the third tune is called Bummer Peak, which is a place near um, Lake Sonoma, which I just thought was a great name. Yeah. And um, <laughs> And so I... Seems like a name that you would like. I loved, I loved it, and um, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess that song is just sort of well, a variation on the same theme, just sort of riding the wave of change, I guess. And then um, the last one I played is called "God Wants Me to Be a Time Warrior," and that's just from a movie called Waxwork Two. It's like a bad horror movie, and um, I just thought that, again that was a really cool title and just dealing with. Um, I'm not even fully conscious of what that song is processing, but it's a lot. It's got a lot of notes and it's very hard to play and I hate playing it, but I need to play it. So I do and um, I wrote it for Hoarders and hopefully we'll play it and I just haven't fully, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what it's about yet, but I'm, I think I'll figure it out. Yeah, someday. Yeah. When, when Hoarders comes back on, you can fill us in on it. Yeah, but it, it's, yeah, it's, but it's still sort of like, at least I know a little bit of what it's about. It is sort of like who I am and what I'm doing and that relationship with, am I supposed to be doing what I'm doing or am I supposed to be doing something else? Like coming to terms with maybe I'm just a person that makes music and that makes me happy and maybe that's okay. Do you find yourself asking that question less as you get older? No. No. <laughs> no. Not the answer I would have expected. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I, I mean... Maybe more. I feel like when I was younger, it was just sort of like, I've always known, I've played music, I've played drums since I was three. So it was just sort of like, I came into being as a being that just created stuff. And um, it's only as I get older where the sort of like doubt bug will be like, All right, maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. Like maybe kind of like with you and the, the theater of sort of like, there's no monetary value in the capitalist society that I'm in what I'm doing has almost zero value I mean if I go home with two dollars after a show it's not yeah. exactly success but to me playing to those two people yeah. really deeply actually feels like a success and so sort of like having to battle the sort of like doubt 
bug and just sort of, but I feel like as I get older, perhaps that comes up more often than I would like well, you to. You know, for the lone person connecting with just those two people, that's the gold. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. So I am alone. But wow, for this moment, I'm connecting with these two people. It's stepping into a, a different reality. And boy, is that exciting. Yeah. And scary and and, uh, and beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible thing to do. I'm connecting with you. It's very cool. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think I know there's a organism in me that is pointing towards, that's what I want, I think. Without the doubt, that's like what I am supposed to be doing. And maybe sort of like the voice comes up of like, are you supposed to be doing this? And I think often that can be an external thing. Like you talking to other people about what I do and then me gauging how maybe if they're judging me or sort of comparing it to what they are doing, that can happen maybe sometimes too, if I'm not careful, like, Oh, you're a doctor. I'm, you know, and, but it's like, I'm not going to be a doctor and I love doctors. They're awesome. So glad that they are there doing what they do. And I maybe should just, ideally just accept what I do and then I can maybe help people not as much as doctors but in a different way I can help people just make my weird music and maybe it'll resonate with them and maybe they'll like it and maybe that makes their life not as shitty and maybe that's as good as I can do I guess yeah Yeah. really important to to hone in on the like you live in a society that probably every day makes you feel inadequate yeah yeah and I think that's interesting to zero in on. And I think non-artists don't realize that. Totally. Yeah. And that's part of like what I want to do too, maybe like with the uh, booking bands and booking shows and sort of like um, illuminating the fact that what artists and musicians do is actually super important for the success of society as a whole. I mean, without artists kind of digesting what's going on around us and spitting it out in a digestible way for other people i feel like society is bland and boring and sort of like the fact that we don't make money i know troubles all artists and except for maybe the ones that are making money but i i have so many friends that i consider to be the most like brilliant minds and they don't know how they're going to make their rent and it's like it's an imbalance and again i'm not like gonna i can't change that maybe but it's still just i still like to to let those people know that I see them and that I do very much value what they do and what they do matters to me. And I think it matters to a lot of people and it is kind of unfair that they can't make ends meet or whatever doing what they're supposed to be doing. But that's just kind of our situation we have to, we have to navigate through, I guess. Yeah. Also, you've never wanted to be a doctor. So those True. like those days where you start to think like, ah, oh, should I do something different? You know, it's, it's important to like, just remember who you are Yeah, and not let somebody else make you feel what like you need to be like them. I don't know. Yeah. Well, those are the worst days because it's like (laughs) you start thinking or I start thinking like I don't have any applicable skills or values. You know, you start discounting what I start to discount what I do and what I'm supposed to do, quote unquote. And I, when the doubt comes in, maybe I'm not supposed to be doing what I do. I realize that that's what I've been doing this whole time. And I can't think of anything else to do. I think ultimately maybe there isn't anything else that I should be doing. And maybe that's why, but if, when you start to kind of like, I don't know, uh, forget or just start the doubt can just be so huge. Then you start searching like, Oh, maybe I should be a, I don't know. I mean, that's not how you found, found love. True. Stop searching. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and I'll just say like, uh, you and I have a lot of the same friends and uh, you, you, you have, you know this, but I'm just going to say it. I, literally hundreds of people I know would hear you say that and just be like, Nope, you're wrong. You should keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> but I, but also I understand that we all have those days where we doubt oh, the path yeah. that we've taken and why we've taken that path. Yeah. 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 Even the people who look the most confident and seem like they have it completely figured out, even that doctor, oh, I mean, everybody has it. I think that's just a condition of being human whether you're financially successful or not. Yeah, totally. I've definitely had like, you know, successful police officers or whatever be like, man, you play in a band. That's so cool. Yeah. I wish I could have done that. I'm like, well, it is cool, but I think it's great that you're doing what you're doing too. And you know, yeah, this grass is always greener on the other side, I guess. I don't know if you ever have derived your worth from the music that you make as opposed to the person that you are. 
But I think that's an interesting thing to think about. When your identity is so tied to the stuff that you make, it can kind of fuck with your self-worth. Yeah. Do you, do you ever you ever felt that? Absolutely. I, I felt like I've had certain friendships, not to, again, name names or get per, too personal because I don't want to um, throw anybody under the bus, but I felt at times like, I'm your drummer. I'm not your friend. You don't, you don't respect me. I, you think I'm good at drums and that does feel really good, but you don't care about how I feel and that feels really bad. So that has come up in my life. And also, um, <clears throat> meeting people like when I met Melinda, she didn't know m- what I do. And it was interesting to kind of, especially growing up around here where every kind of, everybody knows each other and what we do. And I, again, that's a beautiful thing, but it is sort of refreshing when it's sort of like, oh, this person knows me just for who I am, yeah. regardless of what I do. And I think ultimately for me, it's impossible to disconnect what I do from who I am, but there is something kind of like special about being loved for just who you are, not what you're doing. And there's a sort of, like I said, I value what people do, but even still minus that value, which is kind of arbitrary. Can we just value each other just because of, because we are ourselves or whatever. So I think that's, I find that to be really important because especially like, you know, I have friends that are super successful at whatever. And it's like, I loved them before and I love them now. And maybe people, when they get to some sort of place in life where they're doing really well, maybe it's hard for them to know who loves them for who they are versus what they have or what they do or are they cool or whatever, you know? Your entire identity is that you are Gabe Katz, the drummer, the music guy from Sonoma County. Yeah. That's how everybody you know knows you aside from family. So to have someone come into your life that loved you because you were you and love, probably likes music fine, but like really loves you because you're you. Yeah. Incredible. It felt good. And then, and that's so rare because none of your relationships had that feature. Yeah. Because everybody we meet is through these projects that we have. Definitely. Yeah. And you, you even see like, I mean, everyone's socially awkward to some degree, but you know, you, like you go, uh, a touring band comes through and you meet them and you're like, hi, I'm like, Hey, I'm Gabe. How's it going? And they're like, Oh, Hey, how's it going? And then like I play and they're like, Hey, I want to be your friend. And I'm like, I want to be your friend too. And I know that's not personal. And that's not the reason it's not like my only worth, but like you said, like maybe that s- your, your value of yourself gets kind of the wires crossed with what you do. And if you do it well, and knowing that you have a value, that's just, um, separate from what you do well, I think is very important. And I think that a lot of people don't have anything that they do well. And I mean, there's a lot of people that really feel like they're not special and maybe they just haven't found out what they do, or maybe they just make the best waffle ever and you never tasted their waffle. But it's like, I, I feel like that's a real thing where people are walking around. I would do it for me. Yeah, me too. This is like, if you're walking around feeling like you don't have anything to offer, therefore you don't, you're not worth shit. I mean, I don't really think that's true. I think that everyone is worth shit or, you know, worth, you know what I mean? (laughs) Please don't put that. (laughs) Okay. If if anything goes in this interview, I want you to write, just put in, everyone is worth shit. Everyone is worth shit. That's the quote. You have both. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Everyone is worth more than what they do, what they know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like people are just, people are great and they are special and maybe even if they don't have like a super talent or a super honed skill or whatever it doesn't mean they're not valuable to some extent as far as like the worth of a human being yeah and that's an incredible thing about you because you are very good at what you do you are excellent at what you do thanks and yet you still hold on to that belief you just stated which is an extremely wonderful way to look at life and there are people who are really good at things who don't feel that way because they are so good at what they do. Yeah. And that's what makes you special. I mean, Thank there's a lot you. of stuff that makes you special, but I'm just going to say this. Um, all three of us have seen each other kind of change and morph from afar over the last 15 years, sometimes up close, sometimes from afar. And it's just really special for Tom and I to sit here with you in 2019 and document where you're at right yeah. now in this time, in this moment. So Thank you for doing that, and thank you for being willing yeah. to kind of step outside the usual comfort zone behind the drum set and share the music that you haven't yeah. shared with a lot of people. Thank you yeah, so much. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. Love you guys. You guys love, are great. Love you too. And in just a moment, we get to see a collection of solo work by Gabe Katz. Thanks Gabe again, Katz Gabe. Katz will flow. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank uh-huh. you. 